let's wait on the virtual reality because it's not it doesn't quite feel ripe enough for us to just engage in a in a sort of wildly natural way. Yeah. Yeah, especially I don't know if you've seen that video of the dad doing virtual reality in his living room and he just jumps forward like Superman and just on the dives kid. through his television. Oh yeah, yeah, lands on the television. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Hey everybody, welcome to Creative Ops, a podcast for creative people by creative people. I'm your host, Christopher Talon, and I am really excited about this one. It's episode number 50. And I have a special guest. His name is Christopher Deridix from the University of Oregon, the CASELS program, C-A-S-L-S. CASELS is an acronym for the Center for Applied Second Language Studies. We'll get it all into what that is because a lot of people think that that's ESL, but it's more than that. There's a lot more to it than that, and I'll let him explain it. Before I do that, I want to tell you one other thing that this guy's got going on right now. Christopher Deridix is also the curator at the Resonance Building. That's resonancebuilding.com, which you'll see in the show notes, which was really fun to talk about because... The Resonance Building is a collective healing and arts community that uses a combination of all different kinds of physical therapies that involve touching the body, but also involve things like meditation and the embodied voice, which is something that's coming up soon. The embodied voice, a Resonance Building field trip, which you don't even have to be in person for. They're doing this stuff online. If you go to the resonancebuilding.com, you can see in their upcoming events the embodied voice. And the Embodied Voice is a two-hour-long workshop that will explore the voice using meditation, therapy ball rolling, breath awareness, visualization, restorative yoga, movement, sounding, and singing. The aim of the workshop is to empower and inspire you to use your voice freely and with full expression, gaining more awareness of the connection between your voice and body. The workshop is designed for singers, people who have no interest in singing, anyone who has been told they have a, quote, bad voice, unquote, and is scared of singing, those who would like to be able to say no more confidently, anyone who has trauma related to expressing their truth, or anyone who has experienced physical trauma in their throat area, anyone with health issues relating to the voice, anyone who feels unheard or has difficulty speaking up, and anyone else who is curious about using their voice in a more free, un inhibited manner you can register for this event at resonancebuilding.com and i'll have the link right to this event in the show notes check it out if that sounds cool to you and also check out christopher deridix on all of his social media he is at swag addicts on instagram that's at s w a g a d i c s that'll also be in the show notes and anything else that you need to say that I might have forgotten. So, whew, that was a mouthful. Get ready for an interview. This was a really fun conversation that uh, actually one of the one of the edits that uh, we bridged in with um, music towards the end of the interview. We had already said goodbye and then stumbled onto something else and ended up talking for almost another half hour. So, <laughs> we're. We weren't sure when we were going to say goodbye. We just couldn't, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't either of us wrap up the conversation. Yeah, it was fun. It was fun talking to Christopher Deridix, and I hope you enjoy this one. We talked about a lot of things, so let's get right into it here, huh? All right, everybody, I'll see you on the other side. P instead of a D, so it was Paradix. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, what what kind of a name is that? Because I've never seen. Yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that name before. Yeah, well, uh, it's interesting. It's an interesting story. My grandfather was Hungarian, and so it's 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 Hungarian, 
I mean, it comes to me through my Hungarian grandfather. Uh, it's not an uncommon last name in, in Hungary, but um, they, uh, I was in Hungary years and years ago and met uh, another uh, gentleman with the last name Derridix, and we were chatting, and he said that there was actually some uh, academic research that had been done around it, and it was like that there wasn't Hungarian kind of as far back as they could they could trace it but i don't remember what it was slavic or something like that hmm. in in hungarian the pronunciation is dorodich huh. yeah <laughs> you should just start going with that from now on really throw yeah. people for a loop dorodich a lot of my friends call <laughs> me by my last name and so and and one of them was greek and he so he kind of got the the sort of uh the spirit of it and he called it right out he's like hungarian you pronounce that dorodich and i was like yeah Doradich Krzysztof Adjok. But that was as far as that's as far as my Hungarian gets. So Yeah. Well, it's better than mine. Um yeah. <laughs> okay. Real quick, let's just kind of go over your education. Your education started, I'm guessing, with you thinking of teaching or not not really so. Great question. Teaching. Well, if I'm really transparent and go all the way back, I'll tell you, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Christian Ministry. So like my earliest orientation was around um, recreation. And, you know, I worked at a summer camp. And so there was a sort of educational valence to it. But it was more, I guess, spiritually informed is the way to say it. I went to an incredible, very conservative, but like very, at the same time, open-minded if that's possible it is possible because it was the experience i had um i went to a bible college in canada and being outside of the american religious political vortex was really really informative i learned a lot about sort of what comes along with uh, american christianity in the in the sort of political um the, the political underpinnings that are connected to that yeah. And I like I said my sort of original orientation to the world was like uh thinking about the sort of Christian hi history of the enlightenment that we had uh that I, that I inherited that we all inherit as uh Americans westerners um I was oriented to thinking about the world as like that could be known in those sort of spiritual and theological terms but this but this yeah. uh at this at this school I I got, I I was challenged to um, to come to realize as a result of the amazing instruction that I got there and interactions with beautiful human beings that that was one way of orienting to the world. Yeah. Sort of one major frame was the sort of religious theological frame, and they um, they challenged my thinking to see that there were other ways of orienting to the world. And so from there, I went to the Great Books program at St. John's College which is uh, one college that has two campuses. I was at the Santa Fe campus. They have another campus in Annapolis, Maryland. And you study the great books. I studied math and natural science, history, political and social thought, and philosophy and theology. So, so sort of like the history of Western thought, basically. Yeah. And at that point when I did that, I was teaching in a high school for the most part, uh, private high school. And then towards the end of that, I ended up working with special needs students in a public middle school. So yeah, education was definitely the, the trajectory that my career ended up taking. And at the end of that uh, program, and at the end of my time working at the public middle school, I ended up taking a, a major uh, trip. I traveled for a year and went all around the world yeah. and did language study in German uh, for four months and then in South America, uh, speaking Spanish for six months. And I, I had a really, really profound transformative experience, kind of the transformative experience I was I had been looking to looking for in the religious yeah. education and then in the in the sort of philosophical and intellectual engagement at St. John's. I actually had that uh -huh. sort of really, really dramatic, transformative encounter while I was traveling and studying language. And so I ended up going back for another master's and I, I did it in linguistics at the University of Oregon to try to make sense of the, the experience I had and to be able to speak about it more articulately. And so basically the, the work that I did there, um, I became um, focused on and now sort of at the professional expert status around autonomous learning, learning in the wild, learning how to transfer knowledge from one domain uh, into a bunch of different contexts. 
Yeah. And and I yeah now I work I work at a research center at the university where we focus on uh, language and cultural learning in uh, really rich media context, extended reality language learning scenario stuff. Yeah, because the little bit, and I'm still not sure that I have the a full understanding of what that what that all entails. We kind of talked, mm -hmm. and I was saying, is it like English is a second language? Mm -hmm. And you said kind of, but not really. So what, where, where do the, where do the two kind of break off and how do the two kind of work together? Because, you know, I come from a, a background of teaching and I've had kids that didn't really speak or let alone write any English mm -hmm. and were, you know, mildly proficient mm -hmm. in their own language. And it was really tough to, to try to, you know, properly engage those kids in a way that they were actually, you know, doing something worthwhile. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great question. And, you know, I think honestly, that was a really interesting conversation you and I had there at the, the our first interaction. And, and I, I, maybe I've been thinking about it in the background. It feels much easier to answer now. Mm. And it's that I think, and I think I said something similar to this the first time, but it, it's, I think that it's, it doesn't really have to do with any inherent difference in the process of language learning. Like, yes, it's the same thing as what we do is the same thing as ESL. It is. Mm. The difference is that the culture of uh, the academic culture is sort of artificially seg segregated between uh, world language learning for like quote unquote foreign language learning and um, and uh, something like English as a second language. The distinction being the the main sort of practical distinction being uh, most of the field that I work in is oriented towards a, a general sense that although people write against this all the time and say this is absolutely not the case but but this is the fact of kind of like why the distinction exists the idea that we're learning a language that people aren't speaking where we are and we're trying to give people the experience of learning a language that people speak somewhere else that one day you may have the opportunity to encounter in a more rich sense than the than the classroom you're in. So think about your uh, if you're in a high school um, uh, Mandarin class uh, in the United States in a place that mm. doesn't have very many Mandarin um, residents. That's the kind of context that the the sort of people. Um, and I'm, I'm, I chose Mandarin because it's a little bit more eccentric. Uh, Spanish is a good example of why this is problematic mm. because it's kind of hard to live in a place in the United States where people don't speak Spanish. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's always an option. It's always, a, there's always an opportunity to interact with people and in online spaces, you know, like if you're learning Mandarin, you could just, you could turn on any computer and go to a bunch of different places and begin to speak Mandarin. So it's, it's sort of the, the problem is in the academic world that separates the idea from like people have come here and they're trying to learn the language we speak here as opposed to uh, the other side of the field that says uh, we're here and you're going to learn a language of people who that speak over there um, but that's that's really problematic it's not really the reality of our, our situation exactly but that's that's why the separation exists because it's a kind of academic and I think there's some bureaucratic stuff too like a lot of the funding and stuff. It's just, like I said, academic cultural stuff. There's there's different funding for uh, programs that are teaching people who have come here, immigrants, to to learn our language uh, compared to the kinds of funding that we get to teach people to learn languages that, quote unquote, are spoken elsewhere, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think so, <laughs> kind of. Yeah, fu fundamentally, the idea is that, you know, learning language is learning a language. And, and that ultimately it's all the same thing. Yeah. Um, it's just really a question of the sort of mm, the, the, the culture that supports the cultures that support the communities that are participating in, in those activities and the assumptions around like, well, what's available um, in, in ESL, the assumption that's available is that you're learning a language that everybody around you is speaking. Yeah. So, I guess I'm not really sure where do you even start with that kind of thing uh, in terms of like, how do you even approach research to build on some of the projects that you guys endeavor in? Because I've seen you guys have some, I don't know what you call it, not virtual reality, mm -hmm. but something kind of like that programming mm -hmm. um, as well as 
the the things that you have like the 30 day language mm-hmm. challenge that i mm-hmm. saw um do you guys call it castles or, do, or castles yeah I that's right it... yeah castles okay i'm just making sure i'm not the only one that calls it that yeah yeah no that's that's us <laughs> but castles. um yeah um so when you guys go into a something like that how do you how do you even start the research and then putting projects together i guess for example we'll start with like the 30 day language challenge mm-hmm. i just assume that you collect different like researched ways to learn languages Mm -hmm. and the same way that somebody might attack different muscles of the body. You say, here's Mm -hmm. one way to learn something, do Mm -hmm. this today for 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. Here's another way. Or is there more to it? Like in terms of the first day we'll do this because that leads into the second day way better. Yeah, that's a great question. And I think that it actually, the, the um, muscle building analogy is really actually very interesting uh, in ways that I'd, I'd love to talk about. One of the things I love, so I'll just be really clear, like I'm not, I'm not a researcher by, that's not my, my professional background. And my professional background is in, um, in more on the instruction side. Um, and my interests are more heavily in the, in the yeah. philosophy and theory of language. So um, like in some ways, if you, you know, to really talk about the pedagogy uh, and the research, it, I would love to introduce you to colleagues who could really speak very much more clearly. Um, but, but I do, I mean, but this is the world I travel in and I can, I can definitely, I can definitely approach it. And a couple of things I'll say is one, the, um, the muscle building thing, what's interesting to me about that analogy is that it's actually really on, it's a good, good metaphor because a lot of the muscle building kinds of, um, exercises that people do are totally bullshit, you know, (laughs) because it's about looking like you want to look, you know, like a six pack is like a yeah. stupid yeah, thing no, I, to have. I know a guy that uh, I used to work with a guy that was always saying like, all right, man, I can show you my workout program and that'll make you big. Or are you trying to get like strong? Because that's a, that's a different workout. And I'm like, uh, I mean, I'm trying to get strong. He's like, all right, no. Cause I'm, I do this so that I can get my shirt to be tight in the, in the sleeve, not so that I can actually go like hurt somebody or, do a physical task with it. Yeah, yeah, and this is and this is a really big deal uh, because we we are so oriented towards our culture. I think we just have this predisposition towards the yeah, I want to fill out my shirt vibe and not really think about like no, I yeah. want to be able to lift stuff that's really heavy because I work in my garden and I want to be able to move the pots around, you know. Um, and so that really yeah. maps yeah. really really well to the language learning world, and I think probably to a lot of education. But in language learning, it's interesting because um, one of the things that my boss, uh, Julie Sykes, uh, says a lot and her kind of her expertise and the focus of our center is in at the intersection of language in use, functional linguistics, which is in our field called uh, pragmatics, Mm -hmm. pragmatics, functional language use, immersive spaces like like. Second life, like virtual reality, like uh, yeah, the metaverse. I mean, that's that. That's like this is a, a, a te- technology in use and play. That that intersection of uh, technology in use, uh, functional linguistics, and and play is is where our focus is. And one of the things that she says all the time is like, in terms of the best way to learn a language, like those muscle groups. What would those muscle groups be? The answer is. We have no idea. We have no idea <laughs> because everybody's always getting pumped up and they're always like, work your bicep this way, work your abs this way. And nobody's really, a, a, until, until pretty recently, surprisingly, nobody's really asked the question of like, how do you get strong so you can do all kinds of stuff without getting hurt? Um, that's functional linguistics. And so we have yeah. this long tradition of, of pedagogy, and uh, that word just means like uh, sort of how we learn, the infrastructure, the culture of learning, the support, the, the curriculum, all of that stuff. Yeah. You know, it starts like the history of our field starts with uh, what's called the grammar translation method. And that's like looking at uh, texts from dead languages and, and, you know, and trying to use... Um, old texts to be able to understand what people were saying and there's no practical um it's not that there's i was going to say there's no practical application and that's not exactly true i mean the whatever you're doing in the language is practical but you're not going to go out and use it you're not going to go talk 
with, uh, with people who speak that language and, and point and say, hey, that thing right there, I want it, how much is it, you know? Um, and yeah. so that, that kind of stuff, this is why sort of my interest in language in the wild and learning in the wild uh, is, is pretty, it's a pretty hot topic in our field right now because people are trying to really figure out like, well, if you were going to learn a language in some sort of coherent way, what are the, um, and of course, there's a lot of research on this and, and, and I'm, I'm sort of brushing over a bunch of details that somebody who researches that very specifically would be able to tell you, like, here's a little <laughs> bit of orientation to, um, to what we do know. But the, the gist of it is that we really don't know uh, what the sort of ideal um, progression would be. Um, and, and so for me, mm. the, uh, coming back to the language theory stuff, the, um, the main grounding that I get comes from um, what is called like the ecological uh, approach to language, um, an ecology of language that says that something like the environment is the place we start um, and being able to do, you know, to index and point at something and say that and this and me and you, which are all pointers and references and trying to figure out how to use that sort of embedded here we are doing this thing uh, kind of language to, to sort of build out into more abstract things where you can understand uh, grammatical structures and why syntax, you know, changes the meaning of things. But in the history of linguistics, mm. um, people started on the more analytical side. And they've been moving from analytical, which which is like they're looking at grammar and, and word forms and word parts and, and trying to talk about meaning. Um, and then only more recently realizing, oh, oh, wait a minute, meaning meaning is always uh, wrapped up in the in the negotiation at the moment. Um, so there's this major reorganization that's happening in our field. Um, so, yeah, what's the best way to learn a language? Uh, just begin trying it and spend some time with people who understand what they're talking about and having them give you information about uh, ways to improve and help structure your experience. And then also like having like a real need and a real demand to try to figure out how to wrap your mind around the things you want to accomplish, you know, you put your, yeah. put some skin in the game. Um, so it's not yeah. real programmatic in that sense. I would say the best way to learn a new language is to <laughs> go live in the place that you're trying to learn. But yeah, that's not always available to everybody, but yeah. um, fall in love. Yeah, from taking several years of languages, uh, well, not languages, German in, in school, like in high school, I can rem remember about as much useful German as I can the Spanish that I learned from being in Spain for a week and a half. Yeah, exactly. Exa and that's that, that's you're, you're, you're completely in that very, very pithy anecdote are like kind of framing the entire conundrum that our, our field sort of is untangling right now. Lots of people uh, yeah. jumping ship from trying to learn. Because language. we did lots of reps of like, what? Yep. Go up the stairs yep. and to the left. Yep. But like, how many times are you going to say up the stairs and to the left to somebody? Yeah. And the feeling, the feeling of like, hey, you're cute. What's your phone number? That feeling is really sticky for, you know, for being able to attach meaning and, and, and then use the muscles in your, in your mouth and your tongue you know, and the air in your lungs to be able to push out the, the utterance uh, in your target language. Yeah. Like, hey, you're cute, you know. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Yeah, without, without sounding like a weirdo, yeah. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> exactly. Or whatever, yeah. whatever. That looks, you know, that, that, uh, that food looks, looks good. Does it have this thing that I'm allergic to in it? Yeah. You know, those, the, the putting the, the sort of the skin in the game, getting the, the meaning to, um, to mean something to you is really there's a lot of there's a lot of energy in our field right now focusing on that and we would call that uh, uh socially and ecologically valid um contexts i'm curious to know like specifically how castles um works together with uh, existing classes and professors and mm -hmm. how, how you guys integrate kind of the experience for people who don't have, uh, you know, English as their first language or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. Well, at least the stuff that you guys do isn't just aimed at people that don't speak a certain language, but it's aimed at people that, well, I don't know, you can tell better than I can with my rambling. <laughs> yeah, no, no, no worries. With my rambling question, kind of what, what all the, what all the people that are most affected by what you guys do. Yeah. So 
um, so we're we're one of it's either 14 or 16. I can never remember. Um, federally funded language resource centers. We get money from the mm. uh, Department of Education, and the work that we do uh, under that sort of main structuring grant is focused at supporting our field. So we do all kinds of different things. We we create resources for teachers. We create resources for learners. Um, we do professional development workshops for teachers to be able to. Uh, incorporate the kinds of playful and game, uh, you know, game-based um, uh, pedagogy that we that we uh, are are interested in, um, and then yeah, we have like really practical videos for students on really specific topics about like if you look at we have a YouTube page connected to our, our intercom weekly newsletter. And that the newsletters for teachers, uh, but then the videos that that go out there are for students, and they're on topics like all all kinds of things: how to memorize more words, how to how to be somebody just flushed the toilet. I'm not sure you can hear that; but it's very distracting. <laughs> <laughs> I'll just put music in behind it. <laughs> Learners, all kinds of different topics: um, how to how to take turns. In uh, pragmatically appropriate ways, uh, how to engage in, uh, like I said, socially and ecologically valid contexts. How to how to create opportunities for yourself to not only learn um, new words, but to gain uh, friendships that are particularly interesting to you. That that so then over time, your language learning uh, ecology is really tailored to you, and you can you know maybe two or three years from now, when you're in a language learning class, you'll have learned a bunch of stuff because. You 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 do Discord in your target language, you know, or you play you know you yeah. play Halo in your target language. <laughs> so we're 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 trying to help people have those kinds of experiences, uh, and we're trying to help teachers uh, not only teach that sort of day in and day out the very difficult context of being a teacher, um, largely in public schools uh, because I mean, proportionally that's where most people are teaching. Um, yeah. Uh, but but also. Um, also sort of in on the more fundamental longer time scale thing of like getting helping the field to mature to be able to like i said you know like my boss uh, dr julie sykes says we don't know the best way to do it and and we think that e that games have a sort of ecological validity they're like they're they're yeah. meaningful contexts that people can can have a, an ongoing participation with really really rich they teach you a lot about media and technology and 21st century skills so we're advocates for that kind of approach and we're trying to basically support anybody who's interested in engaging in that way teachers learners administrators and and really i mean my my job has more to do with development and learning strategy so my job is a lot about um, connecting with uh, enterprise and getting uh, partners who maybe develop games uh, to, to partner with us and to do uh, really culturally sensitive um, uh, work that that you know that a lot of companies are really uh, unwilling to to touch because we 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 provide the expertise to be able to address sticky intercultural um, topics, right? So I'm I'm looking for partnerships. Uh, that's sort of the, the bulk of my job is to engage people in because I understand the language theory and the philosophy around how this stuff works. I'm, I bring in the the people who who have the kinds of resources and doing the kind of coordination that will allow us to have capacity to serve teachers and learners in game based, playful, technology informed, technology you know dependent, technology mediated learning experience. Yeah. That's very interesting. And I can see like not exactly a direct crossover to what guys like uh, Jeff Hull and yeah. um, um, Mike Augie, Augustine, yeah. uh, what they do, but just this idea that there's a space that's yeah. more meaningful, you know what yeah. I mean? In a social, emotional, whatever kind of a way when it comes to actually creating an experience for somebody and doing something that's meaningful to that person and kind of meeting them at that level yeah yeah along these lines i mean i i i appreciate that reference and and um jeff hall is the is the point of connection between me and your and your podcast i i listened to that i really enjoyed listening to that he's uh he's like a hero of mine i was in grad school i was i tuned into uh the institute and it really because i'm interested in learning in the wild right and crafted context and here's yeah you know he's genius uh artist um who's who's uh 
doing doing all of that powerful work. So yeah. let me. Um, I, I need to grab my charger really quickly, and I, I want to follow. Yeah, no up on, I want to follow up on this theme. Hold on one sec. Sure. Okay, I think actually, I think Jeff Hull is a great sort of pivot into the 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 difference between the sort of language learning enterprise proper and the role that I play in it. Yeah. This will be this will be this is going to get more more interesting, more juicy, more coherent. Okay. <laughs> so, like I said, uh, my boss, the director of the Center for Applied Second Language Studies, Julie Sykes, is a leader in our field, a leader, a world leader at the intersection of play, immersive space, and language in use. And language in use from the perspective of language in use across cultures and how it varies. How some cultures think about power in one way, and how other cultures think about power in other ways. How some、mm. cultures think about、uh, and ask, like asking a favor.、Uh, mm. Certain things are are、uh, severe in one culture and not in another, and then other things、mm. in in a culture might be a severe ask, and in other cultures not.、Uh, things like. Uh, orientation,、um, in, like individual orientation versus group orientation. Some cultures speak as we, and to speak as I in that culture is like a disorienting sort of proposition. And in other cultures,、yeah. it's the other way around.、Uh, hierarchy is a similar kind of in,、so yeah. language in use from the perspective of not any particular language, but all of the different ways that language can function. Uh, you know, informed by all these different cultures. So, so lots of different questions. You were asking really good questions about language pedagogy, and you know, like what do we do, and how does it all fit together? And I think that for me to tell you sort of my my professional trajectory, and then bring Jeff Hall in, it will make a, an interesting story. So I was originally hired right out of gra、okay. graduate school. I mean, I think this will help. I think this will make more sense because we could we could like sort of、okay. shoot、uh, individual topics and I'm going to be like oh that's a that's a hard question to answer. I do I'm I there's a sense in which I I'm, I'm an academic. I have to I have to like not answer any question that is not my specialty with like I don't I can't speak intelligently to that. <laughs> so let me so let me tell you. Here's here's the here's the story. In graduate school I was writing a、uh, a capstone project focused on Um, what I had titled、uh, the, the, the capstone project was an emergent ecological curriculum for study abroad, thinking about individual learners going out into the world. I was in, inspired by Ram Dass's "The Curriculum: Life is the Curriculum." So, how do you like programmatize that? And I watch the Institute, and I think, oh my goodness, this is really, really interesting. This person made a game in San Francisco, and it just is like. Profound. I was learning a lot, and I had done a little bit of work, professional teaching work around、uh, LARPs, and so, and then I got really interested in the idea of the the sort of、uh, Scandinavian LARPs that are a little bit more、uh, live action role playing games.、Um, for those who aren't familiar with LARPing,、mm -hmm. uh, and the Scandinavian kinds have a have a sort of a more open world orientation. And Jeff's work is this like very open world、um, game environment where the the boundary between Uh, fact and fiction is blurred, and and that and I I'm interested in that same exact chasm, but from the other side of the of the gorge, from the sort of epistemological、mm. side that asks,、uh, how do I get grounded versus his is like how do we unground people in, in, in both productive, <laughs> right? I'm thinking、yeah. I think yeah, yeah. My, all of that sort of philosophical background. My interest is in epistemology.、Uh, how do we know what we know? Semiotics. What is the nature of meaning? Right, so these are the kinds of things I'm studying. How do we get grounded? How do I learn something and use it to transfer into other domains?、Um, calibrate my capacity for understanding something in one place to apply in another situation. And he's like completely undoing that,、uh, but in a in a productive way. So I think this is really interesting.、Mm -hmm. So I end up getting hired、uh, at the end of that program by、uh, our our director Julie.、Um, To work in a virtual reality language learning project funded by Deutsche Telekom for the Syrian refugees coming to Germany. Oh, and 
um, through that process, I learned so much. I spent a bunch of time in Germany. I spent a bunch of time working with refugees. Um, I spent a bunch of time interfacing with Julie and really, really fun, like actually learning, like, what do we do? <laughs> uh, because it is yeah. kind of hard to wrap your mind around. And, and we are yeah. pretty eccentric in the, like, well, you think about regular classroom environment and like, how, what does extended reality have to do with like learning in a regular classroom? And this is the story I'm, I'm trying to, I'm, I'm trying to tell here. I'll, I'll try to get, get through. Yeah. Yeah. One of the things that was really striking to me, so Julie's an expert in, in innovation. That was the biggest contract the University of Oregon has ever signed with a private company. Uh, it's like, I think it's $1.3 million. And so she's like a total maverick, works across cultures, across contexts, really good at doing this sort of translational work and, and, and technology development. I mean, she gets how to build apps, how to work collaboratively across a bunch of teams, which is part of the intercultural piece, right? Like understanding the dynamics and then addressing the dynamics in discrete questions, discourse, trying to trying to nail all that stuff down. So yeah. I noticed that developing for virtual reality took a lot of energy and resources on the sort of engineering side. And we spent a lot of time just mm -hmm. managing the process. And I kept asking questions about, is this our expertise? Is our expertise in like Scrum or in Agile, you know, development. And we, are, we, we, we can do it. We have a tech team. We have people who develop, but we don't have, we can't, like looking at the sort of the development of, of education and this sort of transdisciplinary mandate in, in, the, in the world to come, in the world now, like nobody can do it all. We have to be more rhizomatic in how we, how we do all this stuff. So the big question I asked was like, well, what is our like main expertise? And I think, and I started sort of pushing for the program, I think that our main expertise is actually in the social, orchestrating the social dynamics and then orchestrating participants who can help us to make those environments come to life in ways that, that put the actual sort of engineering of the virtual reality space further away from us and give us more of the kind of control that we have the most control over. Right. So then this is where my development work started coming in. And I started moving towards like building a network of people who were capable of handling the virtual reality development for us and, and us feeling comfortable mm -hmm. working with them. Right. And looking for partners who could do all of those different pieces and let us do the part that focus most on the social organization and focusing on on integrating media across a bunch of contexts. So. Um, so we started moving in the direction of away from that virtual reality project once that was done into more ex, a sort of a disposition towards extended reality, which, which feels more natural because it's already, we're already saturated. I mean, all the conversation around the metaverse, like from my perspective, the metaverse started, you know, whatever, however long ago, 40,000 years ago, maybe more, like when we started flint napping and we, our, our hands changed shape as a result of beginning to make tools. We started making tools yeah. and making tools change the shape of our hands, right? And probably vocal production has also changed the, the, the shape of our bodies. We're going up, right? We're getting taller. We're coming off the ground. Yeah. Hip, hips are getting underneath us. As our hips go underneath us, our shoulders come on top of our hips. It frees our diaphragm to, and the hyoid bone and all of this to be able to project all of this stuff out. We're, that's the metaverse. We're, we're already moving. We're already, techno yeah. already co-articulating with technology. So let's design experiences that make good on this continuum always being at play. Let's not go into some space that's ethereal and computational and, and, and completely dissociated from the body, which is bad language theory, right? Yeah. That's like, we already learned that lesson in linguistics. Uh, that's like the computational theory of mind that just says it's all happening in the brain in a vet. That feels to me like, we learned that lesson and now we're thinking about the extended mind so extended reality extended mind the the emotions are cognition using hands are cognition interacting with re people in relationships is cognition so like how do we make pedagogical experiences that blend all of those dynamics together so there you're in the extended reality experience right yeah so like I said, Jeff's work was really inspiring and, and this is all very collaborative and, and I, I'm saying maybe I, I, I pushed in this direction, but there was, no, there, there was no sort of lack of awareness about what I was saying. I think this is a better way to go and everyone's like, they understand it all better than I do. And we just, you know, we just start moving in this direction. So what we, what we ended up doing was we, um, 
we started uh, iterating and kind of prototyping on the a sort of media environment that uh, Julie really brilliantly has, has sort of formalized as a, a mixed reality experience toolkit. So we have a yeah. we have a we have a toolkit that has a bunch of different kinds of resources in it: analog resources, uh, digital resources puzzle types, uh, narrative frames. We have recent uh, publications around crafting context and uh, designing mixed reality experiences that uh, facilitate collaboration in the moment, but then thinking about extending that collaboration. I think that's the, the paper I, I sent you um, previously. Yeah. So, so as we were iterating on this, we got, um, we, we were conceptualizing this move away from that, that sort of heavy, virtual space and feeling like, okay, maybe we can get there at some point, but the amount of effort that it is to engineer this environment is just really problematic for, for what feels like a natural, what feels like a natural implementation of what we're, what we're best at and, and what, how we know that the world works. So let's wait on the virtual reality because it's not, it doesn't quite feel ripe enough for us to just engage in a, in a sort of wildly natural way. Yeah. Yeah, especially, I don't know if you've seen that video of the dad doing virtual reality in his living room and he just jumps forward like Superman and just on the dives kid. through his television. Oh, yeah, yeah, lands on the television. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. And that that's like, yeah, there, it pains my heart that, that people are like so, not not that it's not interesting and engaging, but that like, that that would be the, uh, that that would be the thing that we're striving for feels really flat to me. What we're, what I'm yeah. striving for is integration across all of these domains. Trying to integrate mm. that, so you know, maybe, maybe, uh, maybe a, a heads-up sort of display that you can see the environment still, like an AR kind of thing. But even more thoughtful than that, even more higher dimensional, um, where we're really integrating different kinds of technology, different kinds of media across a bunch of way, uh, di dimensions in the way that Jeff's experiences do. Right. So I was going to say that almost that almost sounds like it gets into. A, I don't know if you've read or seen. Um, Ready Player One, yeah, and everyone kind of exists on Oasis, and Oasis yeah. is this everything where you can buy stuff, you go to mm -hmm. school there, you can mm -hmm. play games there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't want to see that. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that that I think that that's too flat because it only yeah. exists out there, and we're already. I mean, you you we're right now. This conversation is is technologically mediated. This is a rich space, you know. Uh, we met on yeah. Instagram. I I, uh, I I followed up on on your website. Uh, like those are dimensions, right? Yeah. And that's what Jeff's great at. And so we and yeah. that's, this is how we think about crafting context. So with the mixed reality toolkit, we started iterating. We did a um, a live experience, a locative like place based game in Montreal for our colleagues. Uh, at the Calico Convention, just like I think, cons I, I always forget, Consortium for Language Technology uh, Professionals, like researchers who work in language and technology. Um, lots yeah. of people focused on play. And we did, a, we did an experience that uh, used a narrative that was a local narrative about the Simon McTavish, who was a fur baron. And, uh, and we, told, we, we told the story that the, engaged the participants in having to ask the ghost of Simon McTavish, who's like the headless horseman of Montreal, basically, uh, okay. they had to ask him in a pragmatically appropriate way, a, a way that a ghost would be responsive to, to go away and to stop haunting. And so you had to solve all these puzzles and go to these different locations, including his memorial, um, to, and use a, an analog, uh, two-sided, um, 11 by 17 uh, what we call a field folio with an orienting letter on one side that tells the story of Simon Mintavish. It basically lets you in on the joke, lets you in on the game, onboards you to the experience, and then on you flip it over. And it has the it has the clue embedded in that note about uh, to download the uh, what we call the Vault Modulator, the 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 app, the mobile app that integrates uh, across all of the 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 space, the place, the analog. Uh, material and then the narrative and the objective all of these pieces are integrated in this way that I'm describing so we had our our uh, our colleagues do this in 2019 and then uh, they went through the experience solved the different puzzles uh, and then we the kind of the objective the social function at the end was to have them all come back to the conference hotel bar 
and everybody had an amazing time. We filled this entire place up with our colleagues just, you know, e either griping about the horrible time they had or <laughs> smiling and full of joy about having played a fun game with their friends. And that's all good to us. That's a win. That's, that's the win. They're there. We brought them together. And that's the catalytic function of crafting a context and ha having it pay out like that. So then we've done several of those. Uh, that I, at that stage, I was involved really heavily in sort of the conceptualization and the and the and the implementation of that particular experience. Yeah. And then and then I we took it uh, the next level um, was so at that point we didn't really have a toolkit. We had an experience. So then we're trying to trying to kind of flesh out this 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 toolkit, and uh, we did an innovation summit. And instead of so notice in the first case, we didn't do it for students. Right. We did it for colleagues who would have a, a clearer sense of what we were up to and maybe be a little bit more gracious as we we're kind of working our way into this <laughs> yeah. extended reality space. And then the next one we did was um, we actually did it, uh, not for, again, not for students, but also not exactly for colleagues. We held a development event called the Mavericks Congress, also in 2019. And it was an innovation summit. And at the Mavericks Congress, we, we said, we're going to invite a bunch of innovators. Uh, we want you to meet each other. We want to do a day-long game. And we have some development initiatives that we're trying to advance. And we invited people who we think you all spending time together uh, would be beneficial for you because these are interesting people who are accomplished in sort of ways that, that could be mutually beneficial. And then in, in the middle of that, we had four different groups, uh, subsets, four different subsets of that larger group to talk about specific development initiatives that we were advancing. And the reason we invited these people and grouped them in these special ways was to have an opportunity to talk with each of those groups about those spe four specific development initiatives and, and mm. co-create avenues, co-create opportunities to, to elaborate those possibilities together which is a, a sort of an implementation of the kinds of things we're working to do for learners. Yeah. Give them a container, give them a ship to, to get into, to, to sail into a territory that will open up for them. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So then we did that. And then the very next implementation. So now I'm, I'm giving you, this is the sort of development and learning strategy piece of my, of my role. Um, the mm -hmm. next thing that we did was the, concrete we took a, a textbook that was really popular um a yeah, spanish textbook written by uh, robert davis one of our colleagues at the university of oregon used in a bunch of high schools across the country we took one of the chapters and said in this chapter this is like every single spanish textbook is going to have this theme and what we want to do is is give it a sharper point and create a, an entire gameplay mixed reality experience where we're going to throw analog resources on top of all of the content that they learned in that lesson, in that unit. Uh, so postcards, uh, more maps, uh, uh, subway maps. Um, and, then, and then all of that is keyed into uh, the vault modulator, the, the, the app that we have. And students use the, the, the app to uh, find out what the next task is use the analog resources to, to trigger, you know, they trigger augmented reality overlay, they trigger uh, speech uh, recordings, they, they use do speech to text to see if they're getting the right answer. So basically, it's like an escape room in a in a packet with a, you know, with a with an app. Um, and that and that yeah. was the sort of the most robust, um, the, the sort of the final the final piece in our in our iterative process in developing this mixed reality toolkit. Now now we have this sort of very fleshed out thing that we are continuing to develop. Uh, we have implementations for um, business people to learn about communication across across cultures and across kind of different uh, uh, cross functional teams focused mm -hmm. on power, uh, like all of the dimensions I mentioned before: power, uh, social distance. Uh, and and so on and yeah and and we're making we make bespoke experiences like that for language learners or for companies or yeah you name it so i think that that uh, that, that sounds like a growing uh growing field if that field industry even the whole yeah i think that the whole industry is is growing i mean definitely uh the extended reality and the immersive space are are really growing 
and I'm I'm really dedicated to to taking the the in, immense depth of knowledge in our field and sharing it and and inviting participation from others uh, because people in our field understand you know negotiation of meaning across cultures they understand technology uh, development they understand media ecology and we want to yeah we're we're actively I mean in May in Seattle we're doing another um, another uh, initiative at that same um, Calico. I mean, this is the, it's in a, not in Montreal, like in 2019, but in 2022 in Seattle in, in May, we're going to do, actually we're, we're launching, uh, we're launching an NFT for uh, an experiential activation. We're basically like offering, Hey, here's, here's the a position that our field represents in this immersive extended reality world. Um, and we want to offer that position kind of manifesto statement with some research and invite people to fund uh, an experiential activation uh, by by buying an NFT and, and, and inviting community to come participate in one of these kinds of experiences, these immersive experiences that says, uh, here's a way, here's a way to integrate technology that's socially meaningful, that's uplifting, that's, you know, valuable for community. Yeah. 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 Well, a recent guest uh, on the show, too, uh, Marcel Price, who was the most recent past, um, trying to think, poet laureate for the city here, Grand Rapids, Michigan. Yeah. Yeah. They're, I saw that they're developing stuff with uh, the 49507 project that's the same kind of an idea where they're trying to beautify spaces with um, art that's meaningful to the people around that community. But then also, you know, there's things that you can look up and see on your phone. Oh, there's a whole story behind yeah. redlining and gentrification yeah. that goes along with this mural that otherwise is just also a beautiful thing to see. Yeah. Yeah. We have an initiative. Yeah. We we uh, we submitted a grant to the National Endowment for the Humanities uh, under this project title Sight Unseen, which is exactly what you're describing. Working with humanities scholars across the world in particular locations to tell those stories, those unseen histories that uh you know that the main kind of the prominent narratives don't incorporate and in saying this this specific place has a bunch of other histories that are submerged and we want to figure out ways of using media and technology and social you know social innovation social cohesion uh sense making the sense making apparatus that we have to to tell those stories and to to elevate those voices and to bring everybody into conversation because and this is this yeah. cuts against the Ready Player One stuff, you know. Ready who yeah. who owns Ready Player One? You know, like that whole thing is that was one of the cruxes of the whole thing. They had a benevolent right owner, and unfortunately, in our world, it doesn't look quite the same. But the, the benevolence at the top level is not is not there. It's centralized, and and so we're asking like, how do we how do we give? I mean, the the media is metabolizing. We all have the power to do this because we can make videos, we can make apps, we can make, uh, you know, use narrative device and tell these stories in ways that, yeah. you know, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, uh, we were just sort of receiving from the networks, the major broadcast networks, the narrative, the story. And now everything's differentiating and it's getting more interesting and more, dif yeah, more differentiated, more colorful. Let's honor those stories and honor each other and learn how to communicate better. Okay. That kind of moves into something else that I want to talk about too, with the resonance building. Uh, yeah, cool. I was wondering if we were going to cover the whole spectrum. Yeah, here we go. Okay. So resonance building, it's at, at first when I saw just a couple of the posts that were on there, I just thought it was this purely arts thing, but it's, it's more, it's art and healing, mm -hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Or well, no. What's what's the tagline on there? Is is it? It's not art and healing, but it's something to that effect. Um, yeah. Well, it's a work in progress. <laughs> the resonance building. <laughs> um, the resonance building is a multimodality healing space and collective of embodiment and ecologically minded practitioners. What part of you, of your brain, of your spirit, of your psyche? Where does that part of you come from? Mm -hmm. Because that seems like it's. I don't know, not a not a total 180 from what you do, all mm -hmm. the things that we just talked about, but mm -hmm. definitely it's a it's a different space. Yeah. So 
yeah where where did you come into that how did you come into that yeah um this is a know, really there. sweet uh, unfolding conversation thank you chris for giving <laughs> me the opportunity to share um yeah yeah it's really full it's rich and and you really i think the way that you the way that you just framed it does capture some sort of discontinuity in one way to me it's it's um uh, it's crystal clear how they're connected but uh I could totally see from the outside how that's like, what the heck do those things have to do with each other? Uh, maybe it would be helpful to tell another story. <laughs> so yeah, a, little, yeah, a, little bit of, a little bit of background. Um, and I think that really the, the, first, the first sentence or paragraph will, will offer a lot of insight. I have owned a property in downtown Eugene, Oregon, where I live uh, for mm. over a decade and a large, large percentage of that time, that that property, uh, which is a is a house, it, it looks like a house. Uh, it is a mm -hmm. house, but it's also. I was going to say, what is it if it's well, not a well, house? Yeah, I'll, I'll go on. It's it's in a special <laughs> zoning area in the city, and okay. so it's zoned for commercial and R five. So we can have commercial business. I can have signs out in front of the house. I can have practitioners doing business in the space mm -hmm. and also people can live here uh, i've lived at the house most of that time um and uh and and the entire time there have been people working in the in the building and mm -hmm. most of the time like for the it, yeah i said i've owned it for over 10 years and, and in about the for about the last 10 years it has been somatic healing arts practitioners who work in the space Okay, start with yeah. what does somatic mean? Somatic means the <laughs> body, the soma, okay. the body. So we have acupuncturists, we have massage therapists. Oh yeah, like the soma and the pneuma. And all yeah, that. yeah. So somatic practitioners. Uh, so my my home has been host to many people um, coming through and having their bodies. Uh, directly manipulated by professionals who do healing mm. work who do massage therapy you know um yeah like i said acupuncture there's also a um a mental health therapist who's a, a meditation um, actually I'll, I'll say at this point this is a good place to interject the mental the mental health therapist who's currently working here kendra vida is also mm. on the leadership at the neuro meditation institute here in in eugene she basically neuro meditation neuro meditation it's like neurofeedback basically neurofeedback yeah. they put a they put a eeg cap on you and they register your brain state and they are able to tell you which which style of sort of neural signature you have and what kinds of meditation will help you find sort of regulation oh wow that's fantastic because i tell people that if i try to just like sit with my legs crossed close my eyes and focus on my breathing or focus on a specific thought or thing I want to get done or whatever the thing is, I can only sit there for a couple of minutes before mm -hmm. like, you know, that ADD part of me is just yeah. like, ah, I can't take this anymore. Yeah, that's not uncommon. But I can sit there in one spot and not move and play the guitar for hours. Yeah. And so I say that, you know, for me, that's what meditation probably should feel like Great. is what I get out of playing the guitar. Yeah. Well, maybe playing the guitar is meditation. Yeah. Yeah. And actually that, that, there you go. I mean, that's exactly to me, that's, that's what we're up to. That's the creativity piece. So, and the thing that, the thing that sort of combines them all together is that if you're familiar with uh, Lakoff and Johnson metaphors, we live by the work of Mark Johnson, uh, George Lakoff is very, I mean, very well known. Uh, he, he did a lot of metaphor work with the philosopher, Mark Johnson. Mark Johnson mm. teaches here at the University of Oregon. And when I was in grad school, I had the very, very uh, distinct pleasure of taking his uh, philosophy of language class. And in that class, we learned, uh, I mean, like from the mouth of the, the master, yeah. uh, how he would always say things like, um, meaning emerges from the environment through the body. And we... Hold on, let me, let me, let me sit with that for a second. Yeah. Meaning emerges from the environment mm -hmm. to the body through the body yeah. through the body mm -hmm. from the environment through the body yeah okay sorry go ahead yeah. i just wanted to make sure that i got that and i could think about it for a second from the environment through the body 
and through the kinds of environments that we evolved out of. Mm. So meaning is not something that happens on a page. It's something that we have been co-creating for a really long time. And some of those forms have become formalized in ways that we have very efficient shorthand for mapping meaning from one domain to another. But it all has to do with the body. It all meaning has. When to you do say from life. when you say me, mapping meaning from one domain to another, mm -hmm. just give me like a, a quick example. If well, someone's like, I don't know what you mean by that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Lakoff and Johnson's big breakthrough was the book Metaphors We Live By, and they talk at, at length about it. It's a it's an incredible book. Um, but they talk about like uh, so mapping meaning. It's to say that metaphor is the structure metaphor has a lot to do with the structure of meaning and it's saying something like uh okay now now you're you're asking me to dig deep for some specific examples uh <laughs> from from that it was it was a while ago but i i got them here let's see um states are well i'll give you let me give you a specific example and then maybe i won't and maybe the thing that i'm groping for will will, will emerge um yeah states are places or state like a journey life is like a journey we're getting there. Mm. When I say we're getting there, we're getting there means that um, there was a previous place that we occupied. We're along mm. the path of some kind of journey, and we're going to arrive at some kind of destination. Right. Okay. So our interview in this interview, we're really getting somewhere is is metaphorical, and it's it's or at least it's it's maybe it's maybe we mean it literally like we're getting somewhere we're really we're really covering a lot of ground we're really unearthing a lot of territory here in this conversation yeah. but uh, and and we might mean that like in a, in a literal sense like uh, we're we're really uh, a lot of information is coming through we're making a lot of connections this makes a lot of sense but really it's all rooted in this in this uh, locative metaphor a place based movement based metaphor that says well, we started in one place where we didn't know each other. We didn't have a common understanding. And through the course of stepping through the journey together, we're coming to understand each other um, in ways that we didn't before. So we're arriving. We're getting there. Yeah. And, and that, that, metaphor, that metaphorical structure provides a, a framework that they talk about. That, that's the mapping. So in order to project meaning into a given context, you have to have some other set of entailments from an original context that that map to in in order to map to to bridge from one to mm. the other. Uh, so I'll try to use like words that are a little bit more manageable. In order to understand something together that we don't understand, we have to mm. understand something together that we do understand, and we can use the thing that we understand together as a common frame of reference to talk about mm, the yeah. things that that one of us may understand and the other doesn't. So a good example personally is uh, I use a ton of surfing metaphors, especially with my brother who also grew up surfing. Yeah. So to think about like uh, wave selection, if you're, you know, you're surfing, you don't, you can't, you can't take every wave. So one of the things that Lakoff and Johnson talk about is like the logic of space, mm -hmm. the logic of space. And here's an example in surfing metaphor or the logic of time, the logic of experience, wave selection when my brother and I sort of for our shorthand means like, don't, you can't take every wave and you want to take the good ones. Yeah. So you got to be judicious. And so when he says, you know, like, well, it's just a matter of wave selection. It's like, we'll look for the best opportunity. Julie, my boss says, uh, I think this is maybe a Brene Brown reference. Um, she says, you know, what's a bigger yes. They mean the same thing. But we're kind of orienting towards different initial um, initial metaphors. Mm. Um, although that saying yes is maybe, I mean, yeah, it, it's a disc, it's a discursive metaphor. I say yes to this. Um, and so in the in sort of it's it's discourse. It's a discourse based metaphor. A bigger yes is not having another conversation with somebody to say yes to. A bigger yes is like wave selection. It's like saying. Um, I don't want to do that thing. I don't want to have, I don't want to embody FOMO. Yeah. 
I want to wait for the, the right opportunity at the right time and say yes to the right opportunity. It is metaphorical. So all of this is saying yeah. we're mapping, we map something from familiar context to an unfamiliar context and, and the entailments, the, the things, the constellation of elements that make uh, the relationships coherent in the original source have to work in the destination metaphor in order for there to be coherence. Right. And that, that's what I just, that's the connection that I just drew. Wave selection, bigger yes. Those are both metaphors. Yeah. They both mean the same thing. With my boss, I taught, I use one because we're linguists and we use discursive metaphors. And with my brother who grew up surfing with me, we use surfing metaphors. Right. Yeah. So, okay. So, uh, resonance building, it's all about the body. Uh, I'm, I'm, maybe I shouldn't. Maybe I shouldn't do the do the synthesis. But I took the, the took the metaphor theory class from Mark Johnson. Our work at the center is intellectually, historically downstream from that same philosophical well. Mark's work is rooted in pragmatism mm -hmm. from uh, in the semiotics of Charles Pierce, uh, Peirce, uh, and John Dewey and William James, and then historically that came to uh, speech act theory, and then finally to pragmatics. And at Castles, we focus on pragmatics, like I said at the beginning. All of this has to do with the environment, the co-creation of meaning, um, embodiment, and using the negotiation of unfolding sense making with other people that incorporates the environment and our bodies in coherent ways to, to elaborate preferred futures together. Right. Mm. That's what we do at preferred Castle. futures. I've never heard that put that way before, but I like that preferred futures. Yeah. This is part of why I went into linguistics because I wanted to be able to say that kind of shit. <laughs> and my <laughs> colleague that came from a colleague that came from Steve Thorne, who's a, who's a, a brilliant, language theorist who works at Portland State. He was on Julie's dissertation committee. So yeah, I get to interact with these people and, and learn things like that and then learn exactly the question you asked. Okay, so how does that connect to the resonance building? Like I said, I it circumstantially live in this space where people are doing healing arts work. They're manipulating the body and people are gaining a sense of in personal integration and coherence in their own experience in a bunch of different ways through somatic manipulation and massage through uh the uh, the augmentation of chi uh, in in acupuncture and through uh integration interpersonal uh sense making and coherence in the the counseling work and so what mm. really the question that we're asking the question that's really driving the resonance building project is what do the healing arts look like in the 21st century so I get to work with these people who do these, this healing arts work, and, and, and they, they have these deep, deep knowledge of the body, deep knowledge of the kinds of different coherence that these different cultures have made and ways of sort of bringing people back into integration from the disequilibrium mm. that they experience within the culture that they emerge out of. Every kind of culture sure. has its own disequilibrium. Ours, our disequilibrium. Oh yeah, there's plenty of it to go around. <laughs> yeah, and ours, ours is like this, you know, because we're always on the computer and we're always like grinding with our right, you know, our dominant side and using the mouse, and and ours is like that. So a lot of the work that that happens in our culture has to do with that that intersection, and we're actually moving forward like this. So like the the sort of deep ecological. Uh, semioticians sense maker in me says like well, we need to figure out how to get back uh our sense of carriage the way we hold ourselves in that 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 allows the flow of our life and energy and meaning to not be impeded by this you know the metaverse yeah. that's already begun you know steeping into our, our back and shoulders so the question driving us is what do, what do healing arts look like in the 21st century um mm -hmm. i think that this uh it, it, it acknowledges the effect of the extended environment and the presence of the extended environment, including digital technologies um, and, and, and the knowledge that we've developed through science and uh, other practices like Jeff's work, ritual based stuff and, and uh, all of that kind of the alchemy that's, em that's emerging. And I, I mean that right. in the most sort of respectful way. Um, yeah, I yeah, think yeah, those yeah. are practices that have been really disparaged by the uh, by the disembodied mind, 
by the Cartesian thought space that's problematic. And we're seeing that all happen. And we're what, so the, the thing that this, this practitioner said was uh, every culture has its own kind of dysfunction. And um, when she said that to me, I thought, well, what is our, what is our particular cultural dysfunction at this point? And I think, yeah, there's so much disintegration and so much disequilibrium. And we have this really sort of blocked or, or kinked or problematic relationship with technology. Uh, you can see the way that uh, the disinformation campaigns, um, among other things, have, have caused interpersonal social strife between people. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, that's 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 the not just a place where people can play and learn, but it's a place where <laughs> wars are literally being waged. Now it's just a, a matter of warfare. Yeah. So I yeah. think, I mean, honestly, if I'm really, really transparent, I think of the work at the resonance building as sort of a uh, white hat, ecological sense making. That's the, that same sort of asymmetrical. I don't think of it as warfare, but it's the same tactics. What, what is the extended environment? Uh, embedding what is it supporting that people aren't aware of and how can we begin to bring the, all of those extended things that are actually causing us discomfort and pain uh, that are causing people to in, to bring to enter into conflict how can we how can we bring a sense of ecological consciousness pragmatic consciousness how can we how can we get better at becoming aware of the contextual factors that are causing us problems and um, and so our answer is uh, or our kind of the, the answer that's emerging is um, embodiment. Uh, we call them transformative field trips. So we have one coming up uh, that's a, a vocal workshop uh, focusing on the embodied voice. Um, participants are going to, you know, use like meditation and breath awareness and visualization. Um, yeah, for which singing. is cool. I'm just starting to get into that myself. I got the uh, the book Breathe yeah. for christmas but just kind of started cracking into it and really getting to the point where i'm like oh i can embrace these different exercises yeah and they're yeah. very very cool to help yeah. you relax or to help you focus yeah exactly exactly and there's like every spiritual practice has some sort of breath related uh uh you know uh, embodied um enactment that helps the somatic body get integrated this is the function yeah. of spiritual work right it, it's, yeah, and if people are like, well, we don't have one. There's uh, labor breathing, Lamaze breathing. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And we have and we do have science that says a lot about it uh, yeah. and, the, and about the value of breathing and about this. And then the words and then back to the metaphor, inspiration, you know, inspiration. It has everything. Inspiration. It's about breathing. It's about breath. Mm. <sighs> so, yeah, the resonance building is about building community. Um, through people who are what I, this is all to me, this is ecological, you know, this is a kind of ecological consciousness, people who are ecologically minded, who, who see that um, the, the constrained mental space, the constrained Cartesian thought space, the, the, uh, the computational mind, the thought that AI is going to solve all the world's problems is, is low dimensional. It's problematic. We live in bodies, yeah. we live in environments, we live in social in the social world. Um, and and how do we reintegrate? Coherence and integration are the the attractor states for the resonance building. <laughs> yeah, I mean the resonance, I, the, there's the backstory. Um, so like I said, I, I own this building. Uh, people have been doing the healing arts work. When I was in college, I took a singing at this, at this Christian school that I went to with these amazing people. I took a voice class and I learned in this voice class that when my body is relaxed and in its natural state, I will find access to the most profound vocal resonance that my body can produce. So this resonance metaphor has been really meaningful for me to ground my body, to feel that sense of connection to my own experience that's inside of me and not in, in the thought space. And then when the pandemic came, we had a lot of turmoil at the university. We had students 
uh, we, we, uh, the, the Center for Applied Second Language Studies hosts student groups and we had to send them home. So like a major source of funding was cut off. And I had been feeling this growing sense that my own professional capacity, the resources that I, that were under my discretion were being underutilized. And so I offered to Julie, who I have a wonderfully collaborative and intimate relationship with uh, in the, in the most sort of professional way. I mean, uh, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, we, yeah. we were really, we we're just really in sync. And I said, I think that if I focus on bringing everything that you have helped me learn and come into practice and be able to, if I can, if I can integrate that expertise in my custodianship of this healing arts office building, which is what it had yeah. been at that point, uh, I think that I will become better suited, better, better um, supported in doing development work for the center. I think we will have more opportunities emerge as a result of me elaborating that side of my my experience. So I said, what do you think about my hours going down? And she was like, oh, my God, that's a great idea. Thank you. Yes. And so since August of 2020, I've been. Um, I think that's right. Yeah, I've been focusing on the residence building and, and sort of servicing the the work at the center minimally, although that just that just which I my hours just went way back up at the center. And so now I'm, I'm kind of straddling these two worlds. Um, so, yeah, I just started I have been giving and if I can say really quickly, like in terms of there's so much discourse around like anti colonialism and undoing all of that stuff. And I think that and, and this is I, I live on Calip territory that was that was Kalapuya territory. The people were um, Kalapuya Ilihi is the name of of our area. The Kalapuya people were dispossessed of this of this property that I'm speaking from, and and I feel a sense of responsibility. Yeah. And I don't know how best to to participate in that. And in our academic space, it's it's we 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 support uh, native language revitalization like very very intensely, and 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 want to want to promote. Uh, all opportunities for that, uh, all of those worlds and and the spirit of uh, of of those people, um, they're profound, and I we honor that. And I'm thinking like as my own self, how do I how do I not continue to exacerbate, but sort of be part of a sort of loving subversion of the the dominance? And so I've just been giving uh, care to this space with an intention to uh, create opportunities for community integration, community healing. And, and, and like I said, and, it, and it, it's also integrative of my own sort of ecological you know, equilibrium with work and with the space. And so increasingly we're inviting the community to participate in these, uh, again, extended reality experiences here at the Resonance Building. And like I said, healing arts uh, focused, embodiment focused workshops um, and we want to invite people locally and also in hybrid to show up at, at you know different events. Working on giving of myself, it's not it's not uh, lucrative, uh, but I think that it is productive and healing and and beneficial for our local community in ways that I can't quite predict yet. But I guess what I'm what I'm saying about that is. Um, uh, I, I have a sense that by by cultivating and by trusting that process to ev to evolve, the resonance building yeah. will emerge in ways that will um, that will have a an integrative um, aspect, and will will bring conversations to the table and bring people back into. I think I mean bring the 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 us settler, you know, the white folks into a sense of uh, of grief. And, and uh, you know, like an and, and acknowledgement that uh, although it's not necessarily our conscious direct action, we, we inherit a, a legacy that was really violent. And, and you know, like now, now what do we do? Will we part of it, I think, is we embrace the difficulty of and the discomfort of our own experience of, of, of that and try to figure out ways to process our own experience and then begin showing up not outside of our Right. I mean, what I'm saying is I'm not going out and trying to fix anything. I'm just saying, like, within this space here, I think 
um, yeah. creating some cultivation coherence, <clears throat> offering intimacy to you know uh, people to, to engage in intimate connection and with themselves and with community that 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 has a sort of healing restorative effect and I'm and I'm footing the bill with my you know with my I got skin in the game yeah yeah footing the bill is really coarse I have skin in the game and yeah, yeah. well that I, I I can't help but think more about still the the last interview that I did with uh with Marcel because a lot of the the things that he was talking about too that we talked about when it comes to just kind of understanding and undoing all the things that have been done in the name of rate of the, in the name of racism here locally, mm -hmm. it all starts with everybody first learning that it exists, how it exists, why it exists. And then once we all have that understanding, then we can collectively start undoing it. Mm -hmm. And it sounds like what you're saying is yeah. very much the same thing, but instead of that direct cultural problem, it's more of kind of just how to get the most out of yourself and how to, how to heal whatever you might have going on, whether it be through painting or meditation or mm -hmm. whatever it is. Yeah. And I love that outreach of using creativity to heal. Yeah. No, and that, and that, there you, there you go. I mean, somebody that I, a friend of mine uh, said, uh, Oh, what, as, as I was, as I was formalizing the resonance building and trying to conceptualize and, and pin it down, he's like, Oh, this is like the healing arts of meow, uh, the, uh, the meow wolf of healing arts is what he said. And I was like, yeah, the Mao Wolf of Healing Arts. That sounds amazing. <laughs> yeah, collective, community generated. You know, I mean, every people are showing up. I'm, I'm. This is part of what I was saying about the custodianship thing and me having skin in the game. Like, it's not my program. It's my program to hold the space open and to ask for people who are inspired to participate how they feel inspired to participate. Uh, so the the drawing workshop that we did um, last year was with a, an artist from the University of Kansas, Christine Onichek, who um, who I've never met in person, but she's like one of my dearest friends. So it's it's hybrid, right? So it's not just this individual personal experience. This gets at the question that I said that's driving us: What does healing arts look like in the 21st century? It's it's n dimensional. It's it's local and virtual. It's it's mixed. So all of the yeah. a lot of the experiences that we're trying to bring out are experiences that people can participate in, like in a pod. So the drawing experience we we hosted on Zoom. We had people here at the Resonance Building who were doing the workshop, and then we had other people on Zoom and other groups. In you know in Zoom, so in Zoom there were individuals and groups in all of the rooms. Yeah. And for the singing workshop, it's going to be the same thing. We community is a huge part of it. Um, yeah. And and social coordination, all of that stuff. This is where the language, the linguistics part comes in. How do we how do we create containers that allow people, especially in the pandemic times, um, just occasions for for positive social connection. So we're doing this singing thing on the on the 21st of January with the intention that we will have a group here at the house. We invite other people to participate in their own groups. And when our workshop is over, they will be in their pods still sort of in the whatever of the experience that follows and have an opportunity for community um, because they already know each other and they already care. So creating occasions for interaction. Yeah. I don't know why, but for some reason that just reminds me of the uh, the tool that I learned as a educator in training, you know, asking kids at the end of a class before you dismiss, you know, say, hey, tell me five things that you learned today, because, you know, two out of those five things might not be intended things that were learned, but that were learned out of a conversation or somebody going, oh, you know, I actually have experience with that. And one thing that they didn't say was this. That is entirely the role that I play. I mean, that's like the lion's share of what I offer. All of my colleagues are really, really great in a, in a bunch of ways, and especially at the content part. And I think what I'm really good at is the container part. And what you yeah. just said is, I mean, I'm a, I don't know if you're familiar with the anthropologist Gregory Bateson, but I'm like an insane Gregory Bateson fan. 
and he has the exact concept and construct around what you described. He calls it deutero, deutero learning, which is the sort of the peripheral of, and of my, my collaborator, Kendra, calls it uh, the difference between what's taught and what's caught. Mm. And what's caught is all of the stuff. And Nora Bateson, Gregory's daughter, is, is uh, just, uh, I'm also just a tremendous fan of hers. And she's a brilliant human being. And, and she's always talking about this. She calls it warm data, which is sort of the, the meaningfulness of the relationships that nobody's talking about because we're not tuned into that strand or that vein of what's happening. We're all focused on the content. But consciousness is in the context. You know, being aware yeah. of context is what really helps you elaborate um, that preferred future, right? If we just stay stuck in the content, that's why we're, that's why everybody's on Facebook because they're all driven by content. Um, and so thinking about media, ecology, embodiment, community building, um, that gets us out of the content and into context. And we w focus then on instead of, trying to always get it right, we begin focusing on trying to make it right. Hmm. Hmm. That's deep, yo. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I'm glad that there's uh, something I can push people towards too in, in, that, uh, in that vein, in that genre, because I'd like there to be more community around just this show, but there's only so much of an opportunity for that. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. With the, uh, with the format and the kinds of guests that I have. So yeah. this is, this is fun. This is exciting. Neat. Yeah. Well, it's great. And the, the idea of, of having a show around the creativity, the creative process is I, I absolutely love it. I think it's really brilliant. And I, I just appreciate the, the fact that you're holding the space open and, and keeping oh, at it. Thank you, you do a great job. Oh, I appreciate that very much. Yeah. I really do. And uh, yeah, it's, it's a show that's become a little bit different than what I thought it was maybe originally, but, um, man, it's been talking about creativity being healing. Yeah. I started this podcast. Yeah. I think the first episode I interviewed somebody maybe like a week or two before everything shut down, um, initially. Wow. So this, this podcast has become like my creative community yeah. throughout the pandemic and without it, I don't know what I would have done. Great. Well, there you go. I mean, that's exactly what we're talking about. And that's yeah. what, right there. That's a hybrid community uh, focusing on embodiment. The creative creativity is an embodied endeavor. You know, yeah. you can't get away from it. The extended mind is there. You, you think with hands and things and people. And that's, I mean, we're on the same, we're riding the same moonbeam there. Yeah. <laughs> There's everything I learned. I'm certain that who I am is not a function of the learning objectives that my teachers, you know, wrote down. It's a function of the relationships and the and, and the and the what I put together as the result of of all of those experiences. Not to say that it wasn't help helpful in structuring my learning experience, but I just I don't yeah, think no. of it that way. Yeah. yeah. Well, I I don't know I don't know if this goes exactly with what you're saying, but I feel like it kind of does. Um, you know there have been classes that I've gotten maybe a B or a B minus in, but I know that of that information that I absorbed, I absorbed it so fully that it'll stay with me forever versus yeah. somebody who maybe got an A, but forgets yeah. everything, you know, within days after they take the test or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Well, actually, this is actually, this is very pertinent because at St. John's, they, there are no grade, the grades do not show up on assignments. All you get when you get an assignment back is feedback. And it's extensive. That's, it's extensive. that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. Well, the whole program, the program is really uh, interesting. And if you want to cut this back in, you're welcome to I'll just say a little bit. I mean, St. John's is a very interesting program. I mentioned that you only read the source material. So you're reading like Plato and Aristotle and Descartes and, uh, and uh, yeah, Hume and Locke and, and, and Heidegger and Kierkegaard and yeah, like, I mean you just you 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 deal directly with the material. There's no textbooks, there's no secondary or tertiary sources. Also, like I said, there are no grades on the assignments. You don't get any grades, they only get feedback. And all of the classes are seminar style. So you come, you have you come having read 
the assigned reading for the course for the day. You sit down. Typically, there are two tutors. Um, they're called tutors because they're not professors with something to profess. They're tutors. They're <laughs> co-learners. Everybody yeah. calls everybody by their last name. Uh, there are two tutors because they're there to destabilize each other's power. Hmm. And when they ask a question, they, they start the class out by asking a question about the reading. And then this, it's the student's job to, 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 um, to participate in the classroom coming to life through conversation. That is what yeah. happens. And then uh, maybe, Very Socratic. it's, it's incredibly Socratic. Yeah. And then if, if I like, I didn't find out they have to do grades because it connects, it's part of the, it's part of the, the matrix of educational systems and people want to know yeah. what your GPA is, but I didn't find out my grades until after I graduated and I was applying for, um, I was applying for graduate school and I, I, I finally saw my transcript. Did, were you okay with that? Or did you see other people that were very much not okay with that? Because I know some people live for the grid and if you didn't tell them what it was, they would just go fucking crazy. This is part of, I mean, this cuts back through our entire conversation, what you just said and like everything, this informs everything that I had to share St. John's attracts a certain kind of person. You know this going in that, mm -hmm. that you're not going to get the grades. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of research. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with Michael Garfield, the Santa Fe Institute podcast. He also does the uh, his own Future Fossils podcast. So check out Michael Garfield. He's on Twitter a lot. He's very active. He's an incredible has an incredible mind. Encyclopedic knowledge. Um, his work at Santa Fe Institute. Santa Fe Institute's all about complexity theory. Um, but there, he's often referring to studies that say if you have the, the, the fewer key performance indicators, the more gamed the participation will be to, to, get, to get that performance indicator into whatever desired state, the, the, the actor's who are who are engaging will, will mm. they'll they'll move it in the direction it, by whatever means necessary and so it it causes a narrow an intense narrowing of focus mm -hmm. if you want people to not pay attention to what's happening around them give them a very specific performance indicator yeah and what they will focus on is achieving the performance indicator and not what's happening around them right yeah so so did it, it those are the people you're talking about those are the people who are obsessed with grades. And mm -hmm. the reason that in my mind that that's problematic is because they, all that they know how to do is play the grade game and they are not mm -hmm. learning in the way that you described getting a B and learning a ton. In, there were classes. I yeah. Took, the stress is in the result rather than the, what you've gained. And it's, and it's in, and it's in the result by the means of the game that's, that's laid out that indicator as the thing that you're going for. You yeah. don't even bring your own sense of value to it. The value uh, that you're you're striving to achieve is already baked into the system, and you're just like unconsciously accepting that as the thing. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, did it bother me that I didn't see my grades? No, I knew that that was what I was getting myself into, um, and I had always felt like grades were too low dimensional. <laughs> to really mm. tell me the things that would help me get better. And at St. John's, I got, you know, pages of comments about, yeah. you know, like this, your rhetoric is really strong here, but there are some, you know, whatever, there are some ways that you communicate your ideas that seem obscure or in, you know, incoherent or this piece right here, you could have done X, Y, and Z and they write out what they are to, you know, and like, do you, how do you, how often do you get that? Um, yeah. You know? Well, no. I always felt like the best work that I did with any students was in the summertime. There were students from the school that I taught at, and most of the students, I would say on average, were probably one and a half, give or take, years below in either English and or math. Mm -hmm. um, grades were not on the line. But, and, well, you know, grades, 
they just a lot of kids just got used to bad grades or they would make it so the worst grade you could get would be a 50 percent if you didn't turn in turn in anything so that way mm-hmm. it reduced the severity of not turning things in i guess i don't know but mm-hmm. um in the summertime the kids that needed the most help were you know encouraged to come back in the summer and we didn't have any grades yeah, and yeah that's what I everything mean. that we did was just yeah. built towards having like two or three really good written pieces done mm-hmm. that were either like a personal story something that happened to you or something yeah. that you made up or whatever and these kids just i just said here write about this like mm-hmm. this and this kind of a way now it's your turn mm-hmm. and they would do it and i would give them feedback mm-hmm. they would respond to the feedback do something mm-hmm. again i would give them new feedback yeah and we just did that all summer long until at the end they had these amazingly well written pieces yeah that people were like no there's no way these kids it's like yeah that's what happens if yeah. you like Focus really on writing. try to educate them in the in the field of writing not just get them to yeah. learn how to write a thesis statement well, with its three supports and this, a conclusion blah, blah, blah. this is a great example of that what i said bateson's deutero learning and what the deutero part is that in the in the conventional in environment and i i want to be cautious i'm not speaking as a representative of a, a, a <laughs> of castles just as a you know right. just in my own sort of my own perspective that what you learned, what you're describing to me is, in the first case, uh, students learning how to game, look, learning what the system tells them is important, which is mm-hmm. the grades, and not giving a shit about it. Yeah. And so the, into the system, what's important is the administrative convenience of capturing a measurement that doesn't have anything to do with necessarily doesn't have any doesn't necessarily have anything to do with their learning yeah but that's a it's a convenient way of accounting for the fact that they were there and that there they had some kind of participation so the deutero piece there is that the contextual deutero like second the the, the mm-hmm. outline the halo of that experience is grades and, and 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 credit hours are important to the system and you have the group of students responding we don't give a shit about that yeah. In that first case. And in the second case, what you have is you have a a group of people who aren't there f- to achieve grades or credits. Yeah. And you have an instructor who's passionate about writing. And the Deutero piece that comes along there is process. We're going to focus on working through this process until you feel, until we feel as a as a community, we feel like you've achieved something that's got integrity that has a sort yeah. of coherence to it and what do you communicate mm-hmm. there what's caught in that environment is that dude cared about writing and he cared about me and he doesn't have to care about grades you know yeah the, the system is about being convenient for administration credit hours marks scores make the bureaucracy of learning manageable Mm -hmm. they don't make learning necessarily don't make learning happen right yeah yeah and that's the problem that our k-12 education faces now is trying to uh i think the biggest problem they need to they being parents mostly need to get over is this idea that there is a better way to learn besides okay you know what hold on i gotta restart restart that because it's not just parents it's also um administrators too there's a better way to reach people than this like clearly well a b c d e f that's well not not ef Mm -hmm. (laughs) but yeah you know what i'm saying Mm -hmm. um but it i remember telling a teacher one or i'm sorry a principal one time while i was a teacher hey why don't we move towards more like a project-based model or at least can Mm -hmm. i do that in this class and Mm -hmm. he goes and i remember (laughs) i'll never forget this looked me right in the eyes he goes you and I both know that's a better way to do this. Yeah. But I could not sell that to this community. Yeah. So, well, screw the community. They aren't the ones that are the experts and the, the leaders in education. We are. It's like, yeah, but that's not going to fly. Yeah. Yeah. So our, so we, I mean, we focus on project-based learning. These experiences have a, a project element. And what I yeah. think what the, 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 I, I can hear I can hear Julie. I mean, she's so brilliant. I just love working with her. I can hear her saying something about, you know, something about subversion with love, something about doing it 
any ways in a way that uh, that inspires even the principal to see that the community did have it within their capacity to wrap their minds around the value of it because it manifested all of the outcomes. Yeah. You know, and that's the, that's the, that's the bar. That's what's really enjoyable about working in that environment is uh, having colleagues who are so capable of seeing that it's not a binary and that all of the objectives often can be achieved when you, when you really are patient and conscientious and build consensus and work towards getting people to, uh, to see the fullness and to see those pieces are satisfied uh, that you're concerned about and uh, we have skin in the game and uh, we're all going to grow together through this. Well said. Yeah. Yeah, that's the name of the game, man. Well, hopefully people that are doing things in the types of spaces that you are and the ways that you're trying to do them you collectively, you in individually, um, help help us uh, move that needle in the right direction. I think we are doing it right now, Chris. Thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, thanks for the conversation. I loved it. Yeah, absolutely. some of it, some of it was over my head, but I feel like the further we get into it, the more I get uh, <laughs> yeah. easy with the with the material. Yeah, good. Well, I think it's it's like I said, it's really really hard, kind of being being uh, groomed in that environment. People ask specific questions, and it's like. Ooh, you're asking me a really specific question that I just can't do justice to in the way I would yeah. like to. I, I, when I did the podcast, I interviewed some academics and I remember once I got, I, after a couple, I did one and I was like, I'm never going to talk to another academic again. I just hate, <laughs> I hate that. They just, they they won't play ball. But I, I think that the freedom to be able to say, well, let me tell you this story about how this developed. It, it made it a little easier than just trying to kind of look for the you know, it's like whack-a-mole the other way. It's like, I'm not, I can't answer that question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I can't yeah, answer yeah. I don't know. I don't, I can't say, I'm not sure, but I can tell you this is how things have been evolving. And what I just said about uh, growing together and looking for higher order possibilities and meeting all of the needs because we have skin in the game and we care about each other and we want to see these outcomes met and absolutely people are going to hate it, but we're going to, we're going to, you know, love them through it and, and, and elevate ourselves through the, through the difficult discourse you know, in, in all of it, that's, that's the name of the game. That's what we're up to. And, and I, I, I'm sincere that you're, uh, you know, the work you're doing, talking about creativity, talking about, um, the work that people are doing to, uh, to enhance their own experience and to share that with others. Yeah. is totally, totally the same thing. We're, we're in it together. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. Well, keep it up, man. Cool. Yeah, and likewise, I'm I'm really excited about all the things that you're doing, and uh, I'm excited to be on this journey uh, alongside you. Cool. No, thanks so much. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening. Make sure you check out the show notes and check out everything that Christopher Deridix has going on. And check out the Resonance Building and look at all the workshops that they've done in the past. Check out the one that they've got coming up soon. And just uh, keep that thing bookmarked and keep coming back to it. They're up to good stuff, man. Good stuff. All right. See you guys next time. Mwah. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Yeah, man. Weird, right?